Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge, and welcome to Eldridge and Company. An empty building in Astoria, Queens, didn't just become the only museum in this country of moving images. It happened because of Rochelle Sloven, its founder and director, and her unique combination of interests and talents. And I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Thank you, Ronnie. You, I, it, I'm always amazed at the perfect match between you and the museum. Well, you know, when you make something, you kind of Make force it the match, right? It, that's true, I guess. I mean, the thing has to follow from your own interests or you yeah, can't but, do it. But how did, you, how did you even get the opportunity to do this? <laughs> well, I had been running the CETA Artist Project right. uh, for New York City, Comprehensive CETA Employment and Training Act, which was defunded by Congress in, well, it was funded in 19... 75 right. uh, during the Ford administration, I think. Something. No, yeah. that can't be. But it was defunded in 1980. And so I was going to be left without any work. And meanwhile, a group of labor unions and guild had reopened the Astoria studio for feature film production. And so they asked me to take over as executive director there. And uh, it was just a big, empty studio, really. Essentially, the city of New York had just begun to negotiate with George Kaufman for him to take it over the, the studio. It was the old Paramount Studio. It was the right? old Paramount Studio, old. built yeah. in 1920 by Jesse Lasky and Adolf Zucker as the Paramount East yeah. Coast soundstage. Stage. You know, it was really great, too, because in the 30s, after Paramount went yeah. into receivership, right. and then it became an independent studio, so people like the Marx Brothers May, were on Broadway at night and made coconuts and the animal crackers in Astoria during the day. Isn't that fascinating? That has a great history. Oh, great. Yeah. So you went in and to So I went the... in to, to manage this big empty shell of a big studio because the Army had been there from 1940 to 1972 or so and had vacated it perfectly, except that from 1972 to 1980, vandalism had taken place, you know, yeah, all sorts all of aging. bad things had happened. So Sidney Lumet went in with the Wiz in 1978 and helped reopen the studio. And it was reopened by a nonprofit that was spearheaded by the labor unions and guilds. Mm. And it was called the Astoria Motion Picture and Television Center Foundation, Inc., right? And so I came in as the executive director of that. And uh, meanwhile, the commercial studio had been taken over by Kaufman Realty, yeah. George Kaufman and his group. And so you look around, there was nothing but space. Like, yeah. what can you do in such a place? And I don't like to be alone. I think that's the main yeah. thing. I could probably have, you know, sat yeah. there and written studies about the state of, <laughs> but I don't like to be alone. So what involves a lot of people and is very theatrical and takes up a lot of space? A museum. So great. And so that was great. And it's the only museum in the city, that, I mean, in the country. It is the only museum of its kind in the right. country because it's, we have the combination of film, television, and digital media. You know, not only do we collect the things about movies and TV, but also video games. It's, it's really so It's got archives. It's, we don't collect film. We only right. collect the material culture. So it has costumes, props, posters, scenic elements, lots and lots of toys, games, lunch boxes, that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and we also, as I said, collect things related to um, digital media. We're going to start to uh, exhibit digital art as well oh, as the entertainment. So, but you do have history of film. We do have a lot, a lot of material from the history of film. And, and then it's different from the Museum of Radio and Television because they only do do they have the archives of programs there? They have program archives, yeah. that's right. And, and they, they don't, don't have what you have. They don't have stuff. Right. And that's what we have. So, and you, it's a, a museum for everybody. It's a museum truly for everybody. Yeah. I think that probably to me the most important thing is that it attracts a very broad audience. So the films are, can, are really for cinephiles. Uh, we do all kinds of films, right. silent films contemporary. Uh, we have a little clip, so why don't we yeah. look at this clip and then we'll come back and, and talk more about it. Good. All right. This museum is so unique because you get to do a lot of interactive stuff. You get to actually do the things that you're learning about, which is really fun. This is a museum that lets you in on the secret. It makes you appreciate all the work that goes into filmmaking. Our collection is roughly 125,000 artifacts related to the history of 
the moving image. Everything from projectors to televisions, cameras, soundtracks, board games, action figures. I'm really excited about the costume exhibit. That's always fascinating to see them up close and personal. We're here especially today because there's a Star Trek exhibit. People like the interactive stuff at the museum. They like to come and play with things. When they get involved, they feel like there was in the movie. Can't come. Can't come. Can't Can't got nothing on me. Where's my lady? <laughs> What's most important is that these experiences be incredibly fun. I want my mom. <laughs> <laughs> We've been laughing since we got here. We keep running to the next area and playing with it and then making each other get involved, so we're having a lot of fun. You get to learn how everything happens in the old days and modern days by having fun, not just reading a bunch of signs. You get to actually do it. That's the only museum I've ever been to where they had a, a really cool exhibit all about film, but at the same time, they have a nice theater and they show really cool stuff that I can't see anywhere else. It is unbelievable. I'm sorry I don't have the opportunity to stay here all day long. I love it. Second to my wife. <laughs> if you haven't been here, you need to come through because it's fun, you'll have fun, bring your kids, bring your friends, bring your girlfriend, bring your boyfriend, you know, have fun. We've taken grandchildren there and they love it. Good. And so do we love it. So it's really fascinating. But you, it's thrust you into the whole um, moving images world. <laughs> I have to say that I see your picture sometime in the New York Times when you have a fundraiser, and there you are <laughs> standing next to these celebrated actors and stuff. Is that, I mean, do you love that? <laughs> I, you know, it's a funny thing. You, it's work. It's, it's yeah. so much about so raising money yeah. because that's what those events are about. And so it's fun, of course. Yeah. But it's in a way the excitement of all those flash bulbs going and the whole <laughs> so insanity great. of, you know, look here, look here, look here. And that part's fun. What do you think is, is some of the most popular features at the museum? Well, I think there are, there are, very distinct audiences. There's the audience that comes to our films. We show about 400 films a year, between three and 400 films. Many, many of them accompanied by the maker, by the directors, the actors, are people they, like they, that. So they're current films or they're We both? do a lot of current films, okay. a lot of uh, working closely with the studios, a lot of preview screenings, and we also do retrospectives. So there are mm. big retrospectives, but sometimes, for example, last spring, Robert Altman made one of his very last mm, appearances film, I, I at that. the museum yeah. as part of a retrospective of his film. So, so is that a special series that people subscribe to or is that the members get in our members get in free. It's really a phenomenal movie bargain, mm -hmm. but when you pay for admission to the museum, you also get a, a free uh, uh -huh. You can go to the film right. if you like. And then we have, our, of course, our exhibitions. And our exhibitions are very interactive, as you saw in the tape, very, really a lot of fun. And they draw a family audience. Oh, and definitely. The kids loved it. Yeah, yeah, the kids love it, but, you know, mm -hmm. adults love it, too. I think it's, to me, the most important thing is this big spectrum of the audience and everyone feeling welcome. And, of course, the last most important audience is... Um, is uh, students. So we serve about 25,000 intermediate that's and high okay. school students a year, and that's fantastic. It's really, you know, I always said that the heart of the institution is educational. You want to be educational for adults and for kids, but the service that you provide to the kids is it's just like, why else do this kind of thing? Yeah. Somehow you have to feel that you're making a contribution. Right. And, and, and the archives, what t let's talk about those archives a little So bit. there's a collection. Yeah. It's n we don't usually call it an archive okay. because it's a thing collection. Okay. And there are about 130,000 objects. And actually we're starting a big online uh, project oh, now wonderful. in which the material is going to be accessible online. We have about I don't know, maybe it's like 700 of our silent film articles, or artifacts currently online. And uh, someday, it's probably a 10 year or more undertaking, the entire collection will be photographed and made accessible online. How large is the museum? 
The physical mm -hmm. building? Mm -hmm. The physical building is about 50,000 square feet now, and funny you should ask, because we're You're going <laughs> about <into> <laughs> to expand. <laughs> we're going to have a big addition and the renovation of our whole first floor. We're building a completely new, beautiful 265-seat theater, new galleries, and an education center. So there will oh, be actually great. classrooms de devoted to digital activities and classrooms for younger kids where they can make zoetropes and thaumatropes and all of that sort of thing. Do you uh, have a connection with NYU F School of Film or any of those? No, I mean, we, yeah. we don't have a formal collection yeah. with e a con yeah. connection yeah. with either NYU or, or CUNY yeah, or, or uh, other, Columbia, right. but we certainly have love a lot of it people. when the students come. Yeah, that's <laughs> so great. So when I said this was a perfect fit, the reason I said it was that I know that years ago you loved you were involved with the theater. theater yeah. And you, and I read someplace that you also said the theater is really more of a love than, I hate to say it, motion pictures. Well, don't hate to say it. <laughs> I love the theater. I'm, I'm proud yeah. of that. In fact, I think one of the reasons why it's such a good fit is because there's a way of thinking about museums that makes them similar to a theatrical experience. I mean, it is true that a museum, you move through space, you're not sitting in right. your chair, but something has to be theatrical about it. If it's mm -hmm. not theatrical, it's it not engaging to the audience. Right. And so it's, yes, it's a learning experience, and it's a less passive, in a certain sense, than the theater, but it's a, it's a wonderful place for a theater person to be in a museum setting. Yeah. But of course, I I still love <laughs> so, the theater. So, but, but it does have that that three dimensional quality right. that you love, and it has it, a kind of drama, you know, whether it's the lighting or whatever. Did you it is. always find museums so interesting? I and loved museums from when we were really young. Yeah, from when I, the Metropolitan Museum of and my mother used to drag me to the. Museum of Natural History, and I, I'm sorry to say that I never really liked it because I wasn't that interested in birds and, <laughs> and it was dinosaurs. Dark, right? Yes, but I loved the Met, and uh, I remember actually I used to go to the Henry Street Settlement. Well, I performed at the Henry yes. Street Settlement Playhouse when I was young, and Murray Lewis and Alan Nicholas were the teachers there. <laughs> and uh, one time they we were going to do a medieval play. And they took us to the Met oh. to look at the tapestries to oh, understand yeah. what life. Well, you know, it's was transformative, it. yeah. totally transformative. Didn't you look, look at the knights, too? Well, you looked of at the course, knights, everybody. <laughs> ladies with those big tall right. hats, and they would they pointed to the the landscape behind, and they said, "You see those people's worldview." They didn't yeah. really. That, I don't yeah. know if that was their worldview. But it, flat. Was, it just struck your imagination. Oh, and the very, whole thing. very much so. It was yeah. wonderful. So the common somehow for me, the marriage of museums and theater kind of goes That's back quite, to when I was eight years right. old at Henry Street. And then I think we met during a campaign, or it wasn't Women's Strike for Peace, but it was Bella's campaign. I no, think we may have met at Women's Strike. I didn't Strike. spend much time. Maybe I didn't not. Do that. Yeah, that was me. So you, that was you. You were a member. Of, so you, I mean, you were an activist. I was an activist. So what better as best, as well attribute as to, be. to be a development person, right? <laughs> to develop a museum. You know, it's true. There's a way in which if you, all of us that were involved, and not yeah, you right. more than me, no. but uh, you have to feel bossy in order to go against the grain. Like when we were opposed to the Vietnam War, right. it was very difficult. Right. I mean, I would have arguments with my husband. It was very difficult. So that bossiness <laughs> that makes it, made us all activists, I think is also part of the way that you go on to it's, become a leader a, or something Is it bossiness else. or a courage? <laughs> well, I courage don't know. is a nice way to yes, say bossiness. I, think, well, <laughs> I, when I laugh at bossiness, then you, then you come to the aggressive, assertive, and when we were young, it was conceited. Do you remember? I, you never conceited. hear that word, right? That's Do you right. ever hear that word? That's I remember. Or miss know it all. That's what. Oh, they were well, that's all right. That, that was that, bad. <laughs> but I remember elections, like in sixth grade, where if you were running for an office, you could not vote, vote for, for yourself, yourself because it would be conceited. Now, I used to think of that when I went campaigning, and I'm telling everybody why they should vote for me and how great I am. <laughs> I was really. I thought, oh god. Exactly <laughs> right. Um, so when you first started this, did everybody support it? I mean, you came up with the idea of doing the museum? It was hard. Yeah. I'd say it was very hard. I wasn't the only one who wanted a museum. There were several leaders of the old Story Motion Picture and Television Center Foundation who were interested in having a museum. So you got museum. this idea and you spoke to them about it? Yes, yeah. but not everybody was interested. And I remember going to a lot of the um, 
executives, and they'd say, Shelley, what are you talking about? Museum. There, was actually, there were actually a couple of these board members who just walked out. They left. They said, you're crazy. You keep talking about a national institution. Are you crazy? <laughs> out they went. So that was not easy. Yeah. I would say that was the And then how many years was it before you first opened with an exhibition? Well, we, I started in 1981. And we opened the museum building, which was designed by Guathme Siegel and Associates, in 1988, September 1988. So that's a so good now point. we're going to the next phase, yes. and hopefully in 2009, maybe even September 2009, right. we'll open this expansion and renovation, which is designed by an architect uh, named Thomas Laser. Thomas Laser Architect. Who's an interesting guy. Right? Fantastic, really. Architects great. are. Are interesting people. Don't right? we like architects? <laughs> <laughs> you have a feature in this museum that reflects your activism, and that's the Living Room Candidate, which I read credits that you're the producer of that exhibit. Are you? Well, uh, I'm supposedly <laughs> the producer of everything real oh, large, but in fact, there are two important people at the museum: our curator of uh, our chief curator, David Schwartz, and our deputy director, director of new media, uh, Carl Goodman. And together they organized the Living Room Candidate online. But David had, uh, we, we did a gallery exhibition, and um, I think that was in 92. And then we've had this online version for the. Yeah, it's for so the great. Let's talk about it because I just, uh, I'm always interested in. in what happened to political campaigns? Well, this and is essentially really an a, evolution of it. It's a history of television campaign right. commercials from 1952 to the present. And of course, for some people like me, Stevenson was the first <laughs> campaign right. that one ever had anything to do with. But that was the Stevenson Eisenhower campaign. And what we have is about three and a half hours of streaming video, which is commercials from every year. A, a presidential campaign since, and they can be organized, you can organize them yourself by theme, by type of, in a way, cinematic type, by uh, issues that uh, that uh, were prevalent at the at the particular campaign. So it's fantastic. I say it's like the M&Ms of, uh, of <laughs> internet exhibitions yeah. because you can only watch just one. It's really fantastic. Right. And you can find it at our website, www.movingimage.us. Do you participate in studies? I mean, what the impact? Or do you have uh, figures and information on things like the impact of television on people's lives or the number of hours people watch television or what No, I, that, you, that is that based, kind of that's stuff. generally done. There are other organizations yeah. that do that sort but of that thing. The purpose of the institution is to offer a general education about producing, promoting, exhibiting film and television and digital media. So uh, in a way for us, the fact that we have such an advanced website and we do so much in the digital media area is, a, is a, in a way a part of our Absolutely. mission, of yeah. our overall mission. Let's talk about digital. That's okay. a major thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> And aren't you lucky to be at a museum? Because I have noted that there is a generational gap, or there's a generational barrier, or something. Personally, yeah. Well, I mean, one of I the, love the digital stuff, but I don't understand it. Now, one of the great things about the museum, we we did, we organized the very first exhibition, I think, in any museum anywhere, of video arcade games in 1989, just a year after we opened the museum, and. Uh, what was great about that is people could, who had never played a video game before, right? People right. of our generation, right. feel free because you could relax. You were in right. a museum setting, right? right? Well, now, of course, we've introduced <laughs> many, many of the new games and uh, computer-based games. But st interactivity has remained a very, very important part of the museum. And all of that interactivity within our exhibits is very dependent, of course, on digital media. But we're also interested in the, in the internet as itself. And when we, so when we organize things like the Living Room Candidate online, it's not so much to make a virtual museum, a phrase right. I always hated, right. but to actually use the internet as a kind of gallery. So we always say our theater, where we show our films, is a gallery. It's the equivalent of our right. picture right. gallery. Right. It's a motion it picture gallery. Just like the internet is a kind of extension of the museum by having exhibitions on the web that are made for the web. They're kind of web-born, right. born digital. 
it's so interesting. And uh, and the uh, people at the museum, in particular the the deputy director, Carl Goodman, uh, was has been our curator of digital media since 1991, and I am sure he was the first curator of digital media in the mm -hmm. world. Yeah. So I'm very proud of him. And what's digital art? Well, what's digital art has got to do with artists who use uh, computer-based material and and generally it's it's got some kind of interactivity so a lot of the effect of it I start to move because sometimes you have to move that's the interface the interface is not necessarily rolling a trackboard or a, a trackball or a mouse sometimes the interface is something that the audience does from a distance and the development of new interfaces the the intersection of art technology, engineering, that's a very, very, very interesting to the museum and very interesting to a lot of artists that are that are able to work in this technological You area. never see um, a flat picture of digital art, or do you? You could. Yes, you could. If, <coughs> if for Excuse example, uh, well, you know what video art is, mm -hmm. right? And video art can come as what they call single channel video, which is, it's the image coming through the monitor, right? And you're watching it like you're watching a painting, although it's moving. You can have installations as well. Mm -hmm. in, in a sense, this is very similar. Instead of it being video-based, it's right. based on, on computer-based computer. media. And who do you find? I mean, is, are people as interested? I mean, what are, are they in awe of it? Or are they, are there, do younger people seem to react more than older people? I mean, is well, there I anything? Think that, I think that, um, just like with everything, it depends on the quality of the work, of course. <coughs> Excuse me. And some, some people doing this work have such dynamic ideas, such delightful ideas. And I think that when something is good and you have good quality, you might at first say, wow, this is amazing. How do they do that? But in the end, it's really quality that counts. And it kind of doesn't matter whether it's in acrylics or oil or yeah. digital or right. film. It's you're engaging the audience. You have yeah. something to say. I think that's really important. And <coughs> go on. Don't. You're saying it in a, in, you're saying it in a beautiful Excuse and uh, an aesthetically accessible it's, way. It, the, the Museum of Moving Image is, is such a moving museum, isn't it? It has a progression that's almost more than any other kind of museum. Well, I think that uh, that what's it's unique about us is the subtle ways in which we move among these media. And when we named it the Museum of the Moving Image, that's a long time ago, maybe '85, something yeah. like that. Uh, it was not so many people really understood as well. We were very, very lucky to have chosen that name. And so we've stuck with it, you know? We don't it's have to, great. we've now it's had to terrific. change it. Even with all this convergence yeah. and all of the, uh, you know, there was a time when video games, for example, were made by completely different companies. Yeah. Now the movie companies, the And the, the technologies of everything changed so much. It's all you, convergent. Everything has a history there. Everything has a history, and everything is it's, one thing. And everything is still way. changing. <laughs> yes. It's a, that's the exciting yeah, part. Yeah. And you know, we were talking about digital. This digital revolution has actually occurred in the time that the museum Museum's has existed. Yeah. So if you think about the invention of film, right. or the introduction of sound, or right. the introduction of TV, you this could, moment, this moment of digital media is, a, is one of those key moments. It's and it's a young field, yeah. 100 and something years old. Are there any other move, uh, museums like yours in the world? In the world, there are a few cinema museums. Uh, there's the Cinémathèque Française in Paris, of course, and there's the Museo Nazionale del Cinema in Turin. Have you been but to all of them? I have. <laughs> but and in fact, I may I may be going to uh, India soon to help them develop a museum of moving images, Mumbai. Oh, so yeah, Wouldn't and that be interesting? and that will be interesting, and certainly Bollywood being right. so important as it is, and uh, you know we've been an influence, I'd say, on many museums, not only museums of cinema or television, but museums of popular culture, other museums of popular culture as well. What ones would you be the closest to? Well, I think that uh, certainly the curators who helped start the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame have yeah. acknowledged our exhibits as inspiring to them. And uh, 
Experience Music Project. Right. We, we have developed and had developed uh, over the uh, some years ago a very distinctive exhibition style that integrates objects moving image media, interactive experiences, and seamlessly moves people through exactly. this in a very beautiful way so that it's also a beautiful yeah. place. And your, and your techniques have been adopted by other museums. Yeah. I mean, certainly the Museum of Natural History that we used to find not interesting is now right, filled with its uh, moving image stuff right. and interactive stuff it's, and things. It's hard to believe because we're so small, but in it's, fact, when you really look thing. at when we yeah. did all of this, we've it's, had a great impact, an impact beyond our size. So how do you feel about this? Oh, I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not given to so many people to have the opportunity to no. start something that will live after that. Absolutely. And, and to so. see the creation, actually. Yeah. You know, I'm so tired of talking, and I don't have a product. <laughs> yeah, well, you had right. this, you had it, you dreamt this thing, I mean, created this thing, and you've got such a wonderful product. It's true, but of course, you know, you, it's, you don't, <laughs> nobody does anything alone, right. and there just have been tremendous, tremendous right. support, board, staff, really tremendous. So that's bringing the, people together somehow. And does, do the different industries support it? The industries do support it. You know, one always wishes that there was even greater more. support. Yeah. More is always right. better. The city of New York has been wonderful. astounding, really That's wonderful. Right. The city council, as you know, the yeah. mayor, this mayor, has been fantastically yeah. helpful to well, us. Well, it is the heart of the city. It's a wonderful thing. It's and we right. all boast about it. We're very proud of the city, mostly because of the cultural value and a lot of it right. is from the moving image. It's true and yeah. also the fact that we're in Queens, you yeah. know, it's important right. to remember that right. there isn't only one borough in and this And we hope that we've town. come to the end of this interview and okay. we hope that people will go to Queens, they go to the website, they'll find directions if they aren't there and they don't know them, know, know how to get there and to strongly urge everyone to go to your museum. Thank you, Ronnie. And congratulations. Thank If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.